And we are live. Welcome to another episode of Roasting Marshmallows. My name is Rolf Suit and I am your host. Uh, yeah, so today we are having a guest, uh, a person of diverse interests and broad portfolios. Uh, he's a true technical aficionado and he's calling in from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, but originally he comes from Macedonia. He studied IT and since then has been active in various domains as a developer, lecturer at universities, speaker at conferences, and he ran the Java user group in Macedonia for many years, active with the local software groups as the Hack Club K-I-K-A, Kika? I'm not sure how to pronounce that, Kika. Yeah. It's called Kosov. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I had something here about writing some books, but I think that got removed there. But you wrote the uh, HTML5 Data and Services Cookbook, right? Yeah, it feels like ages ago, like 10 years ago. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah, exactly. And so for the last few years, he has been working as an engineering director at Klarna, where he helped build the Klarna Checkout, Klarna Payment, the Merchant Card Services, and the various other Klarna products that are being used daily by millions of people. He's active in developing the engineering culture by being involved in the open source program, events organized by Klarna, and the marketing activities that Klarna does from an engineering standpoint. Uh, currently active as the director of Trust Center, working on scaling uh, at the real-time detection security operations center, live operations, and customer aftercare as part of the CTO office. Uh, and he's also a member of the crisis management team, which we will get into a bit more uh, later on. But first, let me just uh, welcome to you, uh, Mita Miteski. How are you doing, Mita? Nice to nice to be here. Like uh, it's a pleasure to join this group. Uh, uh, I uh, I've known one of your employees for quite some time. He was my uh, like one of my favorite managers I've had uh, uh, in my career. So uh, I, I was honored to to get like an invitation okay. from him. Wow. Uh, that would be Panche. So that's, uh, that's my first question, right? Why is he your favorite manager? <laughs> Why wasn't uh, so I, uh, so I don't have favorites, uh, but like he's oh, one okay. of the, he's one of the favorites. I, I said like he's one of the favorites. Uh, like no, I, I really like working with him. He's like very easygoing, uh, very very good on communication. Take takes care of the people and focuses on the on the business at the same time. So it's uh, it, he's been one of our uh, the, the best ones I've worked right. with. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Pons is now going to be uh, sorry he wasn't here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So like, it, <laughs> it's best to give praise on, on the on the yeah, side, right? That's like, the question, right? Would you praise him if he were here, right? Because that would be maybe a bit awkward, or which is yeah. exactly, exactly. I kind of was expecting he's here, like to kind of uh, see that awkwardness, but like you're not gonna, <laughs> not, not gonna get that. <laughs> Yeah. No recorders for you. So, um, yeah, of course, you guys heard already uh, Arno and Sylvester in the studio as well. So I want to introduce you guys very, uh, very much now. But uh, just, uh, yeah, good to see you guys as well here. And uh, 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 Mita, to, to start off with, uh, because I know Klarna from a couple of years back, because me and Sylvester actually as well, we used to work, um, like we had an assignment at Afterpay, uh, which is, I think, a direct competitor of uh, Klarna. Uh, and I think this was like six or seven years ago. So how comfortable are you talking to us? <laughs> so I'm comfortable uh, okay. talking with you guys, for sure. Like, So when you say Afterpay, there are actually two Afterpays. I don't know which one you're talking about. Are you talking about the Australian Afterpay or the German Afterpay? I think the afterpay? German one then, probably. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so there, there are two afterpays. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, but uh, it's there. been years, uh, right? So there is no no connection uh, yeah. no. Uh, there anymore. But uh, uh, I did learn a, a thing of a thing or two about what it is that uh, you know paying uh, afterwards uh, basically means. And uh, so maybe you could uh, quickly explain to, to to the listener what it is that Klarna offers. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I will try to kind of. Phrase it in few. Yeah, it doesn't have words. to be a commercial, right? So. <laughs> no, no, no. It, 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 I, it, this is like my my personal view. Yeah. What it is? I wouldn't say this is what our branded marketing team uh, says it is. Um, so the way I see it is like we we uh, enable shopping to be smooth uh, across different channels in different ways. So uh, like depending on which location you are based in, like we have quite different portfolio okay. of products. What we are mostly known in like a worldwide uh, setup is the pay uh, pay in four. Or like pay later yep. in four. So you buy now and then you are able to pay afterwards. So rather than like taking the risk mm -hmm. up front uh, on, on what you're buying, uh, you were able to pay that afterwards without any extra added fees. So this is kind of like the basic basic offer. Obviously, there is like variety of other stuff we have. We are a bank in, in Europe uh, as well. Uh, we have lots of other standards, more, more traditional banking services in uh, Sweden and Germany where we have savings okay. accounts and... Uh, things like that. 
We also have uh, what is now nowadays known as uh, super app, uh, where there is like lots of uh, your uh, financial uh, portfolio. Uh, you can uh, get like a nice personal finance overview uh, to see like where you're spending. You can get like uh, uh, different hints on like how how your uh, like uh, spending behavior is to kind of be more sustainable. Okay. Uh, you can also like get uh, activities like I don't know your CO2 footprint of your orders that you have. So there is a bunch of different uh, um, uh, aspects uh, of, of that. But like kind of we are the gateway to to the e-commerce uh, uh, world. And of course, in different markets, we are maybe uh, widely differently known to to, to different yeah. extent. Um, so that this is how I would phrase it. Um, uh, but uh, yeah. yeah, this is again not not the official no, no, branding. That's, that's fine. But uh, because I was wondering, right? Like the pay now. I mean, the buy now, pay later model. Um, I could see that, like maybe like twenty, twenty five years ago, where buying stuff on the internet was like new and uh, like you didn't really maybe trust the the website on the other side, but. Uh, and of course, I can only speak for my personal experience, but yeah, if I go to uh, like most web shops, like I, I fully trust them that they will deliver the goods that I pay upfront for. Uh, is it still a, tr a trust thing with the consumer, you think? I think to a large extent, yes, it, it is. I, I would say like a lot of this, like uh, there is like, if you go to a store, physical store, right? You, you go yeah. and buy things, you get them with you, like the moment you pay, right? But like when you do that with uh, with an online store, you have to wait for X days, 14 days, 30 days, 40 days. Sometimes it never arrives. Sometimes you get like damaged goods. And at all this time, like your money are held yeah. somewhere else, right? Like you're not, they're not accessible to you for your, for your um, use in, in general, right? Um, so overall, like I think like a lot of that is, is based on, on that. We, um, as part of a standard offering, we have this like buyer's protection. Where we kind of uh, ensure that like you don't not get you're not gonna get charged like so essentially we can pause the payments you can offer a dispute and uh, like we help negotiate that with the merchant to make sure that we you get like a fair okay. treatment uh, so it, it varies right like depending on like if you're buying on a regular retailer in Netherlands right like you, that you have been constantly buying from um, yeah then I would say like probably you, you feel already comfortable yeah. buying from there but maybe you're buying something new for your lovely guitars in the back there yeah. that is like very exotic uh, like uh, thing addition uh, that that maybe it's like very special in this specialty store in a country that you haven't really ordered anything from like uh, like how would you add that extra security yeah. and this is kind of where we, we come in uh, from okay. one extent I right okay did you guys ever use a uh, Klarna or, or Afterpay Arlo or Sylvester no, I don't. <clears throat> I just uh, I just pay up front, but I do know my wife okay. uses it. I'm not sure if she uses Klarna or Afterpay. No, but like the model at least. And I think one of the use, yeah, one of the use cases is is that you you don't pay for everything. Let's say you buy something with uh, clothing or whatever, you have to send some stuff back. Then you just pay for the stuff you Keep. actually yeah. use. Yep. Keep, yeah. That's uh, she doesn't have to check the account if the money actually flows back. Yes or no from that company yep. itself. And obviously, like, I mean, slicing up the payments also allows you to actually be more flexible in, like, uh, your own other budget. If you're buying a bigger couch or, like, I don't know, a PlayStation or something like that, that might kind of hit your day-to-day -day economy in yeah. some way, right? Like, yeah. allowing this to kind of be sliced over a period of time uh, might be more beneficial for, for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, there's a big market for it, right? You're processing millions and millions of transactions. And trying to steer the conversation a bit to this direction. So you're the managing of engineering or the director of engineering. So how did you set up this this, this department? How do you deal with this this load and this market? So one, I'm one of the several others like the engineering directors in the company. We have an organization of uh, 1,800 engineers. I think it was roughly like the last time I, I checked the numbers. And just engineers it, or people. It, Engineers, I'm talking 1,800. Okay. Then maybe we are around 7,000-ish uh, like uh, mm. employees uh, with various different competences. Um, so overall, like there is a there is a quite a different like setup and how things have evolved over time. I would say um, when we um, were starting up, like when I when I joined the company, the company was maybe uh, this was like about six years ago was about 300 engineers and maybe 700 something uh, employees. Uh, and we were only live in handful of markets, I would say at the time. So overall, at that point of time, things were a bit more traditional. There was an engineering department, a product department, a marketing yep. department, and like, um, like obviously people collaborated on projects together and, uh, and so on. But uh, I feel like a lot of the 
decisioning required a lot of like top down approach where um, yeah. things had to kind of circle to the top and then like uh, come back again. Like you, you could not really uh, prioritize things. We had like a concept of like big room planning at the time, which now in retrospect sounds very silly, but like at the time we would gather the entire organization of engineering product marketing and they would be in a big room, <laughs> like, which was like a more or less like a big hotel or whatever, uh, or like a, a area where we could kind of align the priorities for the company. And that would so like and, a PI planning of safe. Yeah. And I think that like that, that, that made sense probably at the time, but I think it became like super inefficient, yeah. you know, like you can't yeah. really like, uh, uh, like priorities shift. Like by the time, like you, you start working on item number two, item number two is like probably relevant now. Like it's probably yeah. should be item number 20. So what term now. did you guys were planning and at that point then for like two, for a year or? No, we were doing like a quarterly okay. plannings, but, uh, like, uh, to, to be honest, like the industry shifts so much and our, our, uh, like, uh, focus shifts yeah. so much. Uh, like while at the time you, I could say like, we are doing these 10 things. I can't say what are the 10 things we're doing today. Like there is a hundred, 200 things that individual teams yeah. are doing. Um, and, uh, uh, around like 2016, 17, we kind of decided to go to, okay, we, we can't really scale like this. It, lots of this is top down. Yeah. Like we can't really, uh, like. We can't get innovation yeah. like this. We are turning into a big, uh, slow moving company. Mm -hmm. We don't want to do that. Right. Uh, so we twisted like the organization around, if you will, uh, we try to have each team, uh, be a startup. So each team cool. is treated like a small company of sorts. So they have their own CEO. Uh, we call it internally accountable lead and each person has their competence lead, which is their manager. So, um, that manager might be the same person as the CEO, uh, while in most cases, that's rare. Um, so if every single team is given a problem area rather than like working on a project, uh, then they have like a end to end responsibility of like a problem space. Right. And they're treated in startup in many different ways. So, uh, how we do their funding. Uh, so myself as like senior leader in the organization, I act more as a incubator with a support team that can actually, uh, kind of give investments and also do provide support, like whether that be like legal support, marketing, analytics, mm -hmm. and things like that. If the teams don't obviously have that in, within the, the capabilities of their own company. And uh, the teams do what we call review sessions, where they actually kind of pitch for resources, right? So they can say like, uh, okay, we want to expand to uh, market X, or like we believe that uh, uh, we need more resources for Y. Uh, like they highlight their own priorities. So rather than like shifting the priority uh, to come yep. centrally, each team has their own, own roadmap, own goals, own, own, uh, uh, own priorities. Um, and how did this transition actually came to be? Is it something that the C-level suite decided like, okay, we're going to do the whole organizational change or is it something that came from below or how did I it go? It, I would say it was like, a. uh, year and a half uh, project and like it, it's still ever evolving there is actually a dedicated team called the Klarna operating model team that is constantly like tweaking this and making sure that it is able to to kind of scale but like about year uh, years time uh, different leaders from different parts of the company were gathered in various workshops and constantly kind of worked their way like how do we organize ourselves and we found that like having things separate like didn't allow anyone to kind of do things end to end so my team could not like really deliver end to end without like Rolf's yep. team or like Arno's team. So in yep. reality, we, we've said, okay, like we kind of try to model things so that like majority of the work, 80% can happen with the team. Obviously, this is not always possible to do with every single team, but that's the idea that like Mita's team can drive their own agenda. They can build things independently. Now, us launching a different market that still will come from a team like Mita's yep. team. But that maybe becomes like a bigger decision where it involves like 40, 50 teams. And then we kind of collaborate together. But for the most part, I would say majority of the metrics that the teams have are on a team level. And then they drive to optimize their metrics or uh, push the targets on those particular is, is Is there a lot of like, because if you say like, okay, we treat all teams as a startup and they need to pitch ideas and all this kind of stuff. Is there a lot of competition between the teams? I think... Uh, uh, when we were starting up, I would say like, yes, because it was still kind yeah. of fresh. We, we had a little bit of that. Uh, like, uh, it was, uh, like, uh, I want to work in this area and this area. 
I think nowadays, uh, I would say like, yeah, sometimes there is a competition of like which business area happens here. I wouldn't say that there is like too much of a conflicting bit that like Rolf team is, is also like competing for the same consumer right. base as Mika's team. I think we've tried to tweak the organization in a way that that happens a lot less. And I think this is where kind of like folks like my role or like maybe folks that are domain leads uh, for the individual domains uh, come in to kind of make sure that they have this more, like, I wouldn't say like fully bird's eye view, yep. but like zoomed out version to actually say like, hey, Rolf and Arno, you, your teams are actually like, having competing metrics like uh, one is optimizing for x but like you're optimizing for y and they they're kind of like notifying right. each other so us joining those review sessions helps align okay. that uh-huh. and how do okay. you handle that and what is the i mean what is the end result is um, one team dismantled or you change the metrics or you merge the teams I, that depends. I think it's like it's a it's a <laughs> it's a very consultant question answer to say like depends, but it, it really does depend. I I, uh, I think we have cases where definitely like we have dissolved teams because that the, we have tested an idea and it didn't work out. Uh, yeah. In my previous role, not as in Trust Center, uh, that happened for two teams that we had. Like we had an idea, we tried it out, like we didn't got the results we expected. We uh, kind of decided to okay, we we're gonna stop this. Uh, and uh, some one of the teams pivoted to something completely different, but others kind of like they said, okay, we're gonna stop investing in this. Like let's uh, let's move on. So there is like a little bit of that. I would say when there is conflicting priorities, then we kind of discuss a little bit on a more domain level. So these teams are kind of grouped on a domain level, and then all of these domains report to a CXO, and the CXOs are not split on competences. So for example, our uh, chief product officer is in charge of our consumer product offering. Our Chief technical officer is in charge of our uh, platforms and uh, like merchant offering. Uh, then our, um, if you have a chief expansion officer, is in charge of expansion, obviously. Uh, and then we have, uh, for example, the chief marketing officer, which is like more consumer growth and brand uh, related mm. activities. So like the domains that fall under that space. So Could if you have, have yeah. oh, go ahead. Could you describe more of how a team actually looks like? Because I heard you say, okay, well, if they don't have marketing, we can offer them that. So yep. how big is the team and what does it consist of generally? So, I mean, we are not super strict on the rules, but our guidance is that the team is up to eight persons. Mm-hmm. Uh, like uh, uh, the accountable lead is uh, like the CEO of the team is someone that is uh, closest to the problem space. So that might be an engineer, a product, uh, a product person, a marketing person, analytics, finance, like all the different competences that we have in the company. And the team has all the competences that they need uh, to handle their own work. So they're, they are generally cross-functional. So uh, a typical, I would say, product team, let's say, that, has a, that is product-led, uh, has a product manager, has a product analyst, has a designer, has like a few engineers, uh, and uh, maybe they have a marketing person. That I would say like is more typical for like the ones that are structured like that. But then it varies from team to team. If I hand pick some of my teams, I have a solution engineer driving one of the teams and he has uh, two engineers and an analyst in in his group. Then I have another team that has uh, two lawyers, uh, um, um, communications person and uh, um, a kind of project manager, like let's say management consultant like profile. Uh, uh, that, mm-hmm. that, that is, is part of that, that team. Uh, so it varies from team to team. What is the problem that they're solving? And, and if you imagine, like, if it was a small company, like a, a five person company, what would they need? Now, yeah. sometimes we try to fill in the gaps through these incubators. Like, maybe there is, uh, like, it's not, the, the, the work is not sizable enough to have a dedicated uh, lawyer on the team, right? Like, we have a, a, a bird's eye view on that, or the support uh, team needs to kind of do a lot of coordination to make sure that Rolf and Arno's team don't uh, conflict mm-hmm. a lot. So then like they, we, we have like extended support uh, yeah. group. But for the most part, we try to keep it. And so you, um, okay. you mentioned that, um, you know, Klarna has like a banking license uh, because I can imagine you yep. guys, you know, manage a lot of funds. Um, and you also mentioned that teams should be able to do like end-to-end you know, just like from inception of an idea or conception, not sure which one is the best term, but uh, yep. until like deployment into production. But uh, at least like the rules here in the Netherlands are like, if you have a banking license, like there are a lot of regulations and guidelines that deployments to production need to adhere to that uh, at the companies that I have been in were never really possible to be done by a single team. Like, you know, it always needed like 
people from other teams to, to sign off the change yeah. or, or whatever. Uh, do you guys have something in place for, for, for that as well? Yeah, so I mean, we are heavily reg- yeah. regulated. Like uh, uh, I, I said, like we are a bank. I don't might not look like a typical <laughs> banker, but I'm banker in all the all the What's all your the, all the uh, in the, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, but like I, I would say, like definitely, like uh, so, um, we try to handle this with like making sure that the tooling allows okay. this. So, a lot of our tooling is uh, based uh, to actually support these bits. Obviously, like depending on the type of goods, there was definitely going to be need of some kind of sign-off. It's not like that people can just mm-hmm. do go completely wild and like uh, do something that is outside of what we are yeah. allowed to do. But uh, I would say like we try to give that freedom as much as possible through the tool. To give you a more concrete example, um, like um, if I, I talk in more technical yeah. terms, if um, uh, uh, me and you are engineers on a specific team, uh, we need to have as bank uh, something called enforceable, verifiable change control. So like it's mouthful, but essentially it means we need to have traceability that meet that did this change. And it was asked by Sylvester, like, and we need to be able sure. to show that how the change reached production. And we need to be able to show that like there was no tampering yeah. in between. So we have built our tooling to actually fully support this. So there is no way for Meta to deploy anything to production without having this four eye view and like a traceability of who did that. Uh, like, uh, uh, and we have this kind of logging around that and like making sure that that gets recorded and there is a paper trail for the full, full chain. I'm explaining this is a very mm-hmm. simple process. Yep. There is like a lot yeah. more complex processes yeah, depending yeah. on the market region you are in, which legislation we are, because we are regulated by right. different financial institutions in the different yeah. regions we are in. Europe is like, you're, you're mostly regulated by your local authorities as well as the European Banking Association, but uh, again, you're working in different regions. Like, uh, in Netherlands, you have the Netherlands uh, 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 Data Protection Agency. It's same goes for yeah. the other uh, mm. other countries. But it, and, and the teams they don't feel that as like frustrating or stifling to their like to their flow because I can imagine like you have to have you know I'm just going to assume you know Jira tickets for everything and like another system where you have to you know put in like a request for someone else to handle and all this kind of stuff. It, it does have an overhead, but I wouldn't say it's okay. frustrating. I would say like we, we've made the tooling to the extent that it's like very okay. easy to do these things. Uh, and we are actively working on making that even easier. So like uh, we, we've tried to kind of simplify yeah. as much as possible. So rather than like uh, uh, not to compare us with a traditional right. bank mm-hmm. in that sense, but like a traditional bank uh, would probably have lots of like these processes that like look good on paper, but they don't actually function in the real life. While in reality, I would say like a lot of the stuff we have is like definitely functioning and it's very okay. trace- traceable and it's made to be easy for the yeah. end customers. I, obviously, I'm overselling us in, in this sense, but I, 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 <laughs> I, really, I, really, I really believe this. Like I believe that the, the, the tooling of the is actually essential to our ability to kind of grow. Yeah. Right? Uh, okay. Well, at least the recruitment uh, department would like you on this answer. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So can I circle back a bit? Because you mentioned yep. uh, that every team has their own metrics, but you also yep. mentioned you need to report to, I don't know, chief product owner, for example. Is that what yep. I, I'm not sure if you mentioned that. Yeah. How does it work? Is it, are, are the teams allowed to create their own metrics? Yes. So uh, um, so each of the teams is treated as a small company. So they have yep. a review session that happens at least once a month. So in this review okay. session, uh, they are senior leaders. So it's usually their domain lead or their accountable group lead or like uh, uh, yeah. it's definitely present there. The key stakeholders are also present. So like the service that they are providing, if it's not for external customers, even if it's for external customers, there will be some stakeholders from the company that will be present there. Uh, so all Those of these... Pa- oh, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Those are not part of the team? The, the, the stakeholders? Yeah, people from within, other people from the company you mentioned? Yeah, so like this is um, the reviews, uh, the reviews, uh, no, they're not like, think of it like, uh, think of it if it was a small company, this would be like the board is visiting the, that small mm. company and they're looking into like, is the team performing well? Like, should we invest mm. more? Like, uh, uh, are the stakeholders still aligned on their actual roadmap? So this is how we kind of try to handle that. And then each of these domains, also like presents that to the to the, the the chief product officer let's say but the chief product officer joins those team reviews as well so like they are actively joining different uh, teams obviously they can't join every team constantly no. but uh, they have a goal that they actually visit the teams at least once a year uh, uh, and 
uh, if we are focusing more as a company with these 10 teams a little bit more now there there is like we are now establishing them they need more attention then obviously that attention from the CXO will come to those particular teams and if you have those meetings uh, with I don't know chief product owner is he actually able to um, change direction of those teams or is it not possible no, definitely like the, the, the general idea is that these meetings are the fast decision, right? Like we, we shouldn't have like lots of like uh, upwards, like layers of, of decisioning happening. We should be able to do everything within those review sessions. So most of the decisions happen on those review sessions. I would say majority of the cases. The only case where things would not happen on the review session is if you haven't really gathered the right stakeholders. That's the only reason why things would not be able to be decided. And that's how we kind of have driven this, not be a big company feeling, uh, even though growing at the same time. But if you are a true startup, you would say that those decisions live in the team itself, I would say, and not necessarily outside of it? Yes. Or am I wrong? No, you, you have a point. But I mean, at the end, like you still have the investors that like will need to buy into your decision, right? Like, uh, uh, like maybe the market nowadays is not uh, as investor deciding uh, 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 right now, but I would say like you still, you're still accountable to something, right? At the end, even us as a company, right? Like we have a board of directors that we need to say the direction and, and they need to yeah. say at the end, yes, on the budget, right? But on the other hand, you could also state that it's not truly a startup because if you are a startup, you would also be accountable for the budget and everything else and your customers but and the flow of money. They, they are definitely accountable for the budget. Like they, they get access to the budget. They, they okay. have an overview of the budget. They can uh, ask for more budget. They, uh, the, they can have traceability of like how much they, they are spending. Uh, the controls are... Like most of the admin things we try to be a little bit abstract away on like more group of teams level, uh, some of these like business control and things like that. But again, still uh, all of that is like visible to the teams. And, and, and I find this very interesting, right? This is actually the first time I heard a big company doing this. So it triggers lots of questions. But um, so uh, let's take a, a product of, of Klarna, like the Klarna checkout, right? So there's actually a team somewhere, let's say for the Netherlands maybe, uh, there's a Klarna checkout team. And that team decides, okay, this is what we're going to build the next period. This is what we're focusing on. Yep. Am I, okay. And then every month you have kind of like a talk with the uh, well, chief product owner and other stakeholders like legal and I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't say always with the chief product owner, like I would say in priority is their stakeholders. So here it would be the go-to-market teams and business development teams that they would need to be invited there. Mm. Uh, like uh, I think the, the, the chief product officer would be more for like aligning the long-term vision. And if we are doing short-term things that maybe are not aligned with that vision, but it, the, the, I would say like majority of that, it would be like the go-to-market teams here, the ones that work mostly with them, partners, merchants, that they kind of work on growing our partner base. So they would be the ones like driving, this is what the market depends. And then the accountable lead for that team actually then makes the decision of this. Uh, and um, okay. like, because when you, when you flip around like the decision making, like in the team, um, it, it enables maybe for a lot more uh, experimentation, for example, that m otherwise may not have happened. Um, is, is, do you also see this, this change, uh, for, you know, more experiments and then maybe like, uh, saying like, okay, this works or this don't work. Let's kill this idea. Is, is there really a culture like that, uh, in the teams? I, I would say definitely. And it's even more pronounced to like the ones that have really end, uh, customer yeah. experience. Like they have like some UX, it's very easily visible right. there. Like lots of, lots of the activities people do are like AB tests and like rolling out functionalities like that. Uh, then, then like, uh, but I mean, this happens across yeah. the, the company. Even like, if I pick my teams now, like the ones that I'm working with, we don't, for the most part, we don't work with now with end customers in, okay. in that sense. Uh, uh, but uh, we did, we did like user testing. We did like uh, uh, like uh, our own uh, version of A/B mm -hmm. testing. So like all of that happened for internal processes, you know, and like we, we are able to do that okay. for the most part. Right? And, and um, you know, if, if, if there's a, a lot of successful experiments and like a lot of value added uh, or, you know, a lot of changes added, like is there any, uh, you know, incentive or reward structure in place for, for, for the teams? So uh, I wouldn't say that we try to tie that directly okay. one to one like uh, on that end, right? Like, so uh, just to give an example, like you might be like in a, a team that has done tremendous amount of work and lots of effort, but at the end, like your, the idea that we were trying out didn't actually yeah. pan out. Does that mean that like you shouldn't at all get rewarded, right? 
Uh, but uh, uh, at the same time, like obviously, like the more uh, value you bring and the, the the more you're in the heat, yep. sort of say, the, it easier it's easier to show the value that, that you're bringing to the company. So I wouldn't say that is like a direct uh, link. Like this is you do X, you get Y. But I would say for the most part, if your team is successful, it's very likely that your personal development and uh, it would be also very yeah. successful. Okay. So does that mean that you uh, you do individual bonuses, not on the whole team, but on an individual? We don't have like that type of like a bonus structure per se. Like, okay. We we we, have, we don't give out like bonuses per se. Like there is like always the rewards but you happening a bank. here and there, like ad hoc. <laughs> we are a bank, right? Like we should have like a bonus on the, on the twelfth, right? No, 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 no. Like we we definitely don't have like we, we don't have that type of setup. Uh, like okay. uh, uh, we we have kind of uh, actively worked because I think. A lot of lot of that, like if if you if you set up that bonus structure, a lot of that would be based on some yeah. metrics, and then those metrics can be manipulated yeah. uh, without like having the underlying yeah. value. And yeah. that I mean, we see this happening. I just do not highlight like, but a, a regular company doing stock buybacks is like the classic examples of of like the CXO team of that company not being aligned with uh, the company values, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, when would you say that you guys, because uh, of course uh, you said like first we did like the whole top down decision making didn't really scale much. So we flipped it around. Like, was there a, a single point where you maybe, I don't know if you were uh, in the company at that time or not, but uh, where you said like, okay, you know, this really works. Like, was there like a success or something where you could really say like, okay, this approach is, is working for us. I, mean, I, I can say it from like my standpoint, I, I wouldn't say it from our like okay. CXO standpoint, so it's, it's yeah. hard to say, but uh, um, I, I think for me, the big revelation was where we were not no longer debating, like, should we uh, go in uh, market A or market B? Uh, like, so look, sometimes we've had a debate, like, should we go into, uh, like, let's say, build functionality for Austria or improve something in, in our core backbone, like, which is like completely unrelated, like, yeah. functionalities yeah. In, in a sense. And we would have to debate those things here back in the day. Uh, the moment we kind of stopped doing this total of debates, I would say like was one part of like revelation that I said, like things are working mm -hmm. definitely. I would say the other aspect was uh, this concept that when we introduced these newsletters. Okay. So um, each of these startups have a monthly like uh, showcase of like, this is what we have been uh, like building and celebration of like what they have actually mm -hmm. accomplished. And at the moment I started seeing like all of these activities happening in the individual teams. Uh, and this was kind of piloted with our uh, consumer app, which we were building up okay. at the time. Um, I, I think I, I, I kind of was completely bought into this idea. Like while maybe I, I had previously, like, well, in, it's a transition period, mm -hmm. right? Obviously everyone is like a fearing change, right? Like everyone, like natural in instinct is like changes, changes bad, right? But uh, uh, I think like uh, when I, when I saw that like momentum happening, I was, Hundred okay. percent bought into this. Like this is yeah. uh, this is the, the right call for us. Did you also experience any downsides of this transformation? Um, yeah, I mean, like it, it's it sounds obvious to, to, to some extent, but like it's harder to do central decision, right? <laughs> it, 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 like uh, uh, if you want to do like a, a central a central push on like a specific policy or something like that. It takes yeah. significantly more effort, right? Like it, it requires a yeah. lot more communication, a lot more alignment. So like all of that, it, 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 it takes a little bit more effort. Um, I think we, we've tried to kind of apply a concept uh, for that, that allows us to do these bigger changes in a... Yeah. Yes. I think I we think are, you, yes. You, I think your your browser dropped off a bit. Uh, also. Yeah. I think you, you disappeared a little bit for us. Uh, Let's continue. Yeah. Uh, uh. No, no worries. Uh, so uh, overall, like um, we, we've set up this concept of uh, leap teams, we call them. So okay. uh, sometimes when, like, when we try to do like a central push of a change, like uh, where uh, we see that like maybe things are moving too slowly because there is like these three startups need to constantly collaborate with each other for some reason, uh, even yeah. though like that shouldn't be the case for the most part. Uh, for those cases, we create a leap team. So the leap team, the idea is that there is a specific goal for that team uh, that is should be uh, short in time frame. So I would say up to six months maybe, but like in, in practice, it's usually like we're talking weeks here. So we kind of pull out individuals from the individual teams 
move them to the lead team to kind of work on a dedicated goal. We maybe add like additional uh, help with like hiring out extra folks and like uh, bringing like a lot more focus to that. And through that leap, we actually kind of jump forward <laughs> in time uh, uh, to kind of push the kind of central direction a bit faster than what we would have normally happened if it, if it was left to the team. Because then the teams would not have prioritized that central change, right? And that was, uh, um, yeah, that was the... I do the- have a bit of a hard time with this because on the on one side you say we try to see every team as a startup, but on the other hand you say, okay, man, we have a central decision. Sorry, guys, yeah. the startup is dead. Yeah, no, this is not... It, that's the thing, like, this doesn't start, stop the startup. It just removes some of the resources from that startup. I, re- I remember it. I remember. All right. So, uh, sorry, uh, we had some technical issues. So, uh, we're back again. Uh, so, uh, Mita, could you uh, continue on where we left off? And then we'll see uh, the damage that was done. Yeah, exactly. No, we, we were discussing about uh, how we are able to push down like central decisions. Right. Like, what, what are the downsides of our, our like distributed uh, setup? And, uh, like uh, the the idea of like having central changes becomes harder, right? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, uh, since it's no longer top down, uh, and individual teams uh, uh, roadmaps will uh, it, it's harder to push items top down to the individual teams roadmaps, right? So it's kind of like the goal. That's uh, Anna's point he tried to make. Right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I I, I think uh, uh, that that was like uh, an obvious downside. Uh, but uh, uh, we we kind of introduced a concept of leap teams to to combat that. So we remove some of the resources from individual teams and we add like additional like uh, power to that like leap team, uh, which is a short lived team that kind of tries to push those X teams into a specific dire- the direction. And that's maybe a couple of weeks time or like sometimes even a week time. We, sh- we don't have like many long living uh, uh, teams like that. We usually have like up to six months for the most part uh, for like a bigger, uh, bigger direction. Uh, as an example, we have a, a, a team that, that like that that required like a technical migration project that was ongoing for a year, and we were doing it constantly on the site, and it was constantly getting rep- deprioritized uh, due to like one of the f- seventeen teams that were involved would always have something else more important to do. So rather than like uh, trying to put it like that, we kind of did the leap team. They focused on that, and it was done much faster than it would have been otherwise. Yep. Oh, that makes sense, actually. If you have 70 teams, there's always going to be one with a different agenda. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, okay, I uh, I want to um, go to a, to a different topic, which kind of relates to the newsletter that you were uh, talking about, because um, you know, to me, that sounds like a lot of transparency uh, from the teams towards uh, the, the company. But uh, uh, we've also noticed that Klarna has a lot of transparency, you know, about at least things that are going wrong towards. The consumers, because you guys have some blogs written about uh, certain outages and, and, and stuff like that. Um, did you guys choose to do that because of the internal transparency? Like, okay, you know, we're doing these newsletters to ourselves. Let's also, you know, blog about the things that go wrong to our consumers. I would say com- it's a combination of reasons why we, we are doing that. But uh, I would say uh, my, my personal view on like why, why we, I believe in, in it is uh, okay. uh, I, our, our partners like uh, have entrusted uh, or b- both our partners and our end customers have uh, entrusted uh, either their like financial uh, uh, aspects or their uh, like uh, uh, payments to us or uh, mm-hmm. their e-commerce business to us, right? Yeah. So uh, like, if we are not transparent, like why would they trust us when we are actually creating an issue? Right. So, like, if we are hiding it from them, like, we we uh, kind of lose their trust at, at the end. Yeah. So, I believe like us showcasing really like what uh, what has gone wrong is really like important for us to kind of showcase like, okay, this is what we actually all, all of the things we did, and this is how we are actually trying to kind of address all of these issues. Because hiding behind it, like just saying like, oh, it's okay now, and so on, it's easy, easy to easy answer. Yeah. And I think many companies choose to just say things like it's a human error. Like, well, everything is a human error in reality, right? Like, uh, again, yeah. everything boils down to being a human error. Mm-hmm. And there is always going to be a human factor in it. It's just like, uh, usually it's a combination of multiple issues. Uh, and we do have an internal process of this five whys asking, like, why is the X happening? Yeah. Like, then, like, wh- why did that? Like, is there an underlying issue? Is it the team understaffed? Is there, uh, like, something like else? Like, maybe four people were sick uh, during that week. But maybe something like, maybe it's like something completely unrelated. Most of the issues in reality are non-technical in nature if you if you dig deep enough. Yeah. Uh, and, um, 
do you then have like a, a, a debate first, like how many, uh, how much detail you can can reveal in these kinds of blogs, and do you have like I don't know, like lawyers or copywriters like actually proofreading the stuff because marketing maybe yeah because I can imagine like. Uh, yeah, maybe not lawsuits or anything, but you can definitely have some, you know, because you're already negatively uh, affected, of course, by an outage, but then also writing about it and the things that did go wrong, I can imagine so, it doubling down. So it, it's it's definitely challenging, I would say. Yeah. Uh, myself being included in, in those processes, I, I think it's it can be quite a challenge on, on the side to kind of how to clearly explain uh, 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 to people without, like, uh, leading them to the wrong conclusion. Yeah. Uh, and I, I've noticed this, like, even if I ignore the public messages, like, uh, as uh, my role, role grow in the, grew in the company, like, when we had, like, 100-something pe people in our organization, like, it's hard to kind of give a consistent message. You always get, like, misunderstood yeah. by 5%, 10%, 20% of the people. And when you're doing this public message with, like, millions of people, yeah. like, it's, you're definitely going to have, like, uh, a, a reaction. So we do spend quite a lot of time to make sure that the message is what we really wanted to say, and there is like very little room for misinterpretation. Uh, I can't say that we have nailed that, but like it, it does require quite a lot of effort uh, yeah. from both the teams that were involved in the actual issue, uh, getting help from our communications person to actually like translate that, uh, as well as like obviously the lawyers have to have a look and, and, and give you that uh, yeah. as well. But I, I would say primarily we are focusing on the get communication and the message, right? Yeah. To, to leave very little room for misinterpretation. And do you okay. do you have? Um, because I can uh, I can imagine it brings a lot of positive things. But like, is there a way for the company to, you know, measure it or at least like get a feel like, hey, this is actually benefiting us to be open and transparent about this? It, it, it's hard to say like that. We <laughs> that we. Uh, 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 are, are um, uh, like directly benefiting from a any of that to be honest. Like, it's no, but very do you get feedback like, like for customers say like, hey, I really appreciate you guys doing this kind of stuff? M most definitely, yeah. most definitely. I think most of our partners really believe, believe in that, uh, that, that it's good that they, they get more information f from us. Yeah. But uh, I, I would say like, it's not like, uh, it's not a clear cut for any company to do this. And many, many choose to like, not, Yes, yeah. be, because it's easier to, to avoid, uh, avoid yeah. that, right? Everyone wants to just put it behind and like uh, ignore the ignore the move problem, forward. move forward. Like it's it's the easier route to, to pick. And uh, I think our, us trying to be more transparent to our customers is like uh, being like customer focused company. At the end, is like in, important to us. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. And, and well, you all, well, you know, you're part of the crisis management team. I think what's it called? CMT. Yeah. So how does this uh, go uh, about, right? So something pops up, yeah, you get a phone goes down, I don't know. So, so, yeah. so, so, so what happens? So, so, so here we're getting into like more regulatory territory. <laughs> no, I, 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 I can explain a little bit. So a crisis management team is something that is actually a regulatory function for most of the banks that exist. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a, a regular function that like uh, to make sure that business operation continues. So things that threaten the company in a significant level, uh, and those type of events can happen like twice a year, three times a year. It's not like a normal yeah. occurrence. So like something, there might be years that nothing like that happens. Um, so like maybe our entire underlying infrastructure had a problem, or maybe uh, something else has uh, has happened. In this group, it's uh, there is representatives from different parts of the company. I'm only representing the some of these kind of. Uh, engineering operations uh, aspects. Uh, the, there is a different chair on that one, uh, that the, and it is like very formal uh, regulatory aspect. So there is a formal law kept on all of that, and that is showcased to the authorities uh, afterwards. So it has dual function of actually okay. mitigating the crisis, but at the same time uh, uh, making sure that everything is kept uh, in, in order. And there is representatives from uh, both of our business development teams as well as our communication teams, uh, legal. Um, like security, etc. So, like overall, like it's a very cross-functional virtual uh, virtual team, uh, mm -hmm. like that gets called in in a crisis state. Like the teams themselves, on the other hand, like have many mini crises on like a regular basis where they get regular standard on calls that most of like I would say tech companies have. Yeah, yeah, of course. And um, when when a crisis like this occurs, uh, what what I've seen at least in, in in some companies is that like you know crisis averted, everything is back to normal. But then like top down management chooses to put in like an extra measure of checks or control, like hey check with me first before you do a deployment of this or 
check with us first before you upgrade a machine to that. Yeah. Um, and uh, in the beginning, of course, of this episode, you uh, explained to us that, you know, you inversed the control back to the teams. Um, so I can imagine it's, it's sometimes tempting as a crisis management team to put in, you know, top level down controls back down to mitigate these kinds of risks. Uh, how do you, how do you go about that kind of stuff? So, or do you do that? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think that can only happen during the duration of the, the issue, right? Like uh, uh, that, that's kind of where our realm of like ability happens. So right. like uh, the crisis management chair, quote unquote, becomes the CEO of the company for the duration of the issue for making the decisions there, right? Uh, but uh, that's not something that uh, uh, that continues afterwards. Mm -hmm. Like the accountability still lies with the individual teams. We have. I mean, we are a bank again, but it's like regulatory function, yep. there's risk control, there, yep. is, uh, uh, there is compliance. We have uh, another layer internally called engineering assurance that helps us like on the automation aspects of this, making sure that everything is traceable and, 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 and compliant with that. And so uh, I would say that accountability kind of flows back into the individual, individual teams. Um, we do have processes around this, around like having retrospectives for each of the incidents, regardless if it's like a crisis level incident, right? Yeah. That's, a, that's a rarity, I would say. Uh, like some of the issues happen, like majority of the issues happen on a specific team level or maybe group of teams uh, and, and impact some customers in a negative way or uh, maybe even like in an unexpected positive way. So like it, it depends on like what has happened, right? Yeah. Okay. Pretty good. Pretty nice. I have one last question about teams that just popped up. Yep. Do you force any kind of like fixed uh, framework for, for teams or is it all up to them? Figure it out, whatever you want to do. For like uh, engineering, you mean? or, or uh... yeah, Well, uh, for a team, right? It's a mini yep. startup. Do you have kind of like a framework for them? Or... You mean like yeah, a, so... they should do Scrum or like technology-wise? Scrum, Kanban or a so, Klarna uh, model? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I can I can explain a little bit like two, twofold. So like if, if, if we talk about like generally like ways of working, uh, we have a couple of things that we enforce and that kind of evolved over time. Uh, so we say like teams should have stand-up, teams, sh teams should have like a planning and a retro session with some frequency. We don't really say exactly, uh, like we're not super strict on like how they actually do that. And then at the same time, we say that teams should have a newsletter with some frequency as well. And teams should have a team review session. That, okay. That's it. Like if they're using Scrum, Kanban, like, or something completely different or, 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 or so on, that's not on like the process reg uh, uh, regulated in that. Time. On the other hand, if we're talking about uh, like tooling and, and so on, uh, to circle back on the, the how do we keep yeah. being a bank and so on, we have certain, uh, like we have a service rule book that actually puts all of these rules and says like, you have to do X, you have to do Y. And then there is, you should do X and you should do Y. And there is mechanisms around how that actually is, in, is uh, applied and enforced. We do believe in like giving the freedom and having the ability to actually propose new things. But then for the most part, a uh, lot of the high level aspects are, are added there. So for example, you cannot deploy on your own in production. That's actually enforced through our tooling and so on. Uh, you cannot like uh, have a um, um, unreviewed change reaching to production. Things like that are, are, are enforced. It's not enforced to like what exactly kind of uh, library you're using for X, Y, Z, or like, uh, uh, or, 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 or I don't know how the pixels are placed or, or so. Uh, that's more to like guidelines and, and, and standards. Uh, okay. And uh, for example, uh, you mentioned tooling and, and do you also have like code reviews, for example, because if a team chooses to do, for example, mob programming or ensemble programming where, you know, six or seven people are actually looking at the code, uh, do they then still have to push that code in a branch and then do a, uh, you know, pull request and then ask the guys that already, or the girls, sorry, that the people that seen the code already to, you know, double review it again, just to satisfy the process. Yes. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> we won't ask you for your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But like, uh, if they already seen it, right? Like it should be an easy task for them to, to, to do that. Right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> easy or pointless. Yeah. It's, it's hmm. <clears throat> but yeah. they, uh, yeah. how much of an effort it is to kind of do that extra yeah, button yeah. then, like if they, yeah. if they have uh, they have done that, right? Yeah. yeah. No, but it's an interesting case, right? Where you just, you, do, you go through the motions to make, uh, I guess the reviewer, and not the reviewers, but like the inspection happy. But uh, I guess uh, you also- The process happy. The process, that's what I mean. Like you have to, but you have to play by the rules, right? When you, uh, 
No, but obviously, like, and, and I, 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 it, at the end, like, you need to know that, like, Rolf saw this. It was not just me that writing this. Yeah. And, like, uh, if that's not recorded anywhere, how would you know that actually that happened, right? Like, uh, uh, well, it's just a policy, right? It could also be you are not allowed to commit anything to production on your own. Yep. That could also be a policy, because if you do, let's say, pair program as a minimum, then you actually don't have this issue anymore. Yeah, but then how do you yeah. know that you someone actually process. sat in the chair right next to the... Next exactly. to the developer. Exactly. So then you have to like put cameras. Well, do you on think? <laughs> do you think that forcing a code review, people would actually look at it? I could also blindly approve. There's no difference. Yeah, definitely. But like then you, you we do have like extra controls on that, right? Like you, you might have an incident. We kind of go circle back and like we actually kind of say like, okay. Well, there's no control, right? So the it, control is an illusion in this part. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I, I mean, you facilitate like, the process. Like, that's what I'm saying. Sure. I blindly approve a lot of code reviews, just like this. You know, <laughs> bam, done. So I mean, like, let, let's pick like, uh, uh, like uh, let's pick an example. Like, uh, uh, so let's say there is like a, a, a manual process that you're constantly like, uh, Mithy is submitting this pull request constantly, and Arno has seen like ten pull requests of the exact same thing. Right? He got bored at this point of time. Mm -hmm. right? He doesn't want to yes. see this. He's just gonna click approve. Like for those type of processes, we actually uh, like, and this is not for mostly. It's not for code. Like we, we kind of try to have this like for for other like manual actions triggered. Okay. We ask actually, Vita is inputting in one place. Arno is inputting the same thing in another place, and they then something on the background checks what the input that is the same, and then it, only then it goes out. Okay. So it, it does create double work in those cases. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, some of our like customer support routines and things like that are, are based around that. But that, that's the way we kind of try to ensure to kind of remove the boring, boringness of it. But like you can't get away, you, you can't get away from like some of the, these bits. And like then you need to have extra measures of controls and like uh, checkups and like random sampling and and so on. Yeah. And um, uh, are these okay. all these checks and controls that you have, are they all mandated by the banking license? Or do you also, because I don't know if Klarna is maybe like uh, on, on some stock exchange somewhere, but do you also have like many other rules and regulations that you need to abide by? I mean, there is many uh, different regulations. When I say regulated, like one part is the banking aspect, there is data protection rules, there yeah. is like, uh, there is a bunch of different yeah. compliance aspects that we yeah. have to abide to and like certifications and, and, and so on. So overall, like, uh, I wouldn't say there is like one thing that mandates us to do that. And I think many of these things are actually like, even if there was no mandate for, from like a banking authority, mm -hmm. they make sense, right? Like the, the four I policy, like makes sense to me. Like there is yeah. like no reason why like non-bank should not have that, right? Like what, why, like why would you not have that, right? If you have the abilities to do that. The four I's principle having it, I think we all agree with it, right? You shouldn't be the one on your own writing code for a financial institution and well, I get for, that for, part, for, for any institution, to... for any institution, like uh, even like... A... We agree. We should yep. do a mob. You should do a pair, right? Yeah. But yep. It's kind of like how you solve it. And, and yep. I get Arno's point, but I also get your point, right? We've all yep. been there and have to deal with this. But yep. um, so uh, being a bit mean, maybe asking about uh, <laughs> no, but it's, uh, it's, how you uh, deal with it. Yeah, but it's a very interesting uh, topic, I think. And... Uh, yeah, I think every company solves it solves it differently, um, and and because it's all just it's rules, right? It's just someone writing something down, and yeah. uh, the way that you handle it, uh, like you guys, you know, fix it in the tooling, which hopefully makes life, uh, you know, bearable for the engineers, uh, which I think is, is is a great thing. But uh, I can also imagine a lot of a lot of companies just do it like a lot, uh, yeah, a lot less tooling based, but more just like, hey, you have to play by these rules and make making life very, very difficult. Yeah, but I, I, if, if you don't, I, I believe if you don't have the default to make it easy for people, they will actively try to find a way to fight the system. Yeah. Fight the system. Yeah. 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 yeah, like approved code reviews. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So if, if, if it's not easy to do that, like people will try to actively find a way to not do that, right? like, regardless <laughs> of what type of setup it is. Yeah. I actually have a story on this. <clears throat> yeah, let's hear it. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish with yep. that. There was a company, I'm not uh, not saying the names, and they had the same process. They forced people to actually do um, code reviews and approve. And um, so this person actually automated that approval process. So he just created a script or whatever to actually go to the page, go to the code review and automatically approve it. And then that's it. 
But then who approved it? Like, did he use his own personal account? Yes, his own. Yes, he just used his own credentials. He automated his yeah. manual process. Yeah. So I think that kind of defeats the whole point of the approval process. And I think he is probably not the only one. So I'm always having a bit of doubts on this whole concept of yeah. two or four eyes <laughs> principles with code reviews saying it works now. Well, I think it's also important to let people understand why it's important, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But there, there is a, there is, I mean, I would say like other controls. Like, l let's imagine there was like an auto approver uh, uh, Arno, and like he always approves like Mita's pull request, right? Like, he at some point Mita will make a mistake, right? Like, and and uh, uh, like when that mistake happens, like someone will say like, hey, Arno, Mita, like how did we, like let's look at how we actually missed this. Like, how can we get better next time around? Like, what would Arno say? Like, he can still lie, obviously, but like yeah. it's uh, it, it, we're getting into a lot of like territory. Like, then you do, do, you yeah. do like yeah. six side reviews. Like, is that like gonna be what? <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah, and I think the point of the code reviews is also like. Um, because a lot of code reviews are being used like, hey, you know, this comma is in the wrong place or, oh, uh, you know, I would put an enter here. But yeah. uh, I think for a lot of rules and regulations, the point is, of course, a lot more high level than, than those kind of nitpicky things, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, so I think that kind of wraps it up for today. Uh, Mita, I don't know if you have anything to add, by the way. If you felt like you need to share something with the audience, then, of course, uh, feel free to do so. I mean, I have a big question. Like, uh, how do I convince you to, to try out Karn a bit more? Uh, more like that's uh, that's kind of like my personal <laughs> personal like uh, always be selling aspect. But like, uh, uh, like how do I convince you to give it a try? Like, uh, uh, well, uh, I will like. I'm Dutch, right? So I always go for the cheapest option. So like for a lot of these pay later payment options, you always see like, hey, you know, you need to pay a 250 premium or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, man, if there's a web shop that uh, does a free option to do uh, to do pay later, I'm definitely going to give it a shot. I would say we have quite a lot of Dutch that, the, uh, stores that have uh, free pay later, and I would suggest you to download the app, try out like the discounts uh, there. So right. I think like uh, uh, I'm kind of like uh, echoing like the, the, the Dutchness <laughs> in this sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Yeah, man. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna download the app. That's a, that's a good suggestion. If you have some discount codes, then uh, yeah, man. I'm 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 a, I'm a sucker for discounts. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> gonna do that for sure. Thanks a lot. Uh, so Sylvester, Arno, do, do you guys gonna try Klarna now? Yeah, of course. I'm gonna download the app as well and uh, check it out. But uh, I've now learned how the whole engineering department is is, is structured. I think it's uh, it's rather impressive. So yeah, yeah. Let's see if uh, if it's uh, up to par, right? And how the quality is. I, I have my reservations myself, but I'll tell my <laughs> wife to use it. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. All right. But at, at least I've acquired three customers, so like it's it's good. <laughs> so there's your there's your bonus, right? That's the exactly, that's the like, structure. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. All right. Well, let me to thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, yeah, Sylvester, Arno, thank you guys as well. And uh, of course, I want to thank Thanks. the listener uh, for for ch tuning in. Uh, sorry about the technical uh, difficulties in the middle there. I hope you guys uh, haven't missed much. And uh, if you have any suggestions, then uh, feel free to send us an email at uh, podcast at forscouts.nl. .nl, sorry. Uh, and of course, you can reach us on Twitter. That's uh, twitter.com slash forscouts. Uh, Mita, do you have a, a Twitter if people have any questions? Uh, yes, Mita Mitreskiat. Twitter. Like, All right. Yeah, Twitter we'll, Twitter. We'll, uh, we'll, include, uh, we'll include the link in the, in the description. Cool. Well, thanks very much and see you guys later. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of ScoutCast, Roasting Marshmallows, with your host, Rolf Sird. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit 4scouts.nl and on Twitter at 4scouts. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time on ScoutCast, Roasting Marshmallows.